found some interesting phenomena emerge in chapter 47. You think everything will be an, an anticlimax after 46, don't you? Well, you're wrong. There are no anticlimaxes in the Book of Mormon, at least not many of them. So, now, I talked about those, we talked about the four uh, types of civilization and so forth, and they're clearly marked, they're clearly marked in the Book of Mormon, that's a good mark of that, of authenticity in the Book of Mormon, they're clearly marked in all history, but of course none of them is 100% pure, they all mix, but one will always dominate in a particular area. But every one of them has its virtues and every one of them has its vices, and uh, so they run the cycle. They do. Now, this chapter 47 is interesting because it brings in a queen. Uh, you notice there are queens in the Book of Mormon, mentioned 22 times, but they're never among the Nephites, just among the Lamanites. The Lamanites have queens. Why don't you think the Nephites have queens? Hmm? Remember, what, si what type of society does Moroni, do Moroni and Alma represent? Here, the brotherhood, you remember? The ideal is if, if it could be the brotherhood, the church is the brotherhood, and so forth. They're the brotherhoods, and you'll always find the queens among the, um, among the Lamanites. And uh, so this is a very basic thing. It's been asked people, people complain, why are there no women in the Book of Mormon? That's unfair. It's, it's obviously loaded. Uh, and uh, Brody object to it. Lots of people do. Only two women are named in the Book of Mormon, but they're, they're archetypes of women. The one is Sarai, who is the mother in Israel. She's the mother of all the, the descendants of Lehi. And the other is Jezebel, or Isabel. She is the mother goddess. She is the worship in Central America, all throughout the Americas, all throughout the world, see. Mediterraneans, the, uh, all, all the American cults, the mother goddess plays a very important part. And of course, uh, she's Babylonian, and in that case, she, uh, she belongs to that type of civilization. But no, she's the fertility goddess. She's universal. And you notice what, uh, well, what Alma tells his son Corianton. He says, why did you go over to the land Siren and play around with Jezebel, the harlot Jezebel? She, she's, she has enticed many away. The youth, of, the youth of the land were all streaming over to Siren. Well, wh why would they have to go to Siren to misbehave? Siren was out of the country entirely. To the Lamanites, to Siren, he said. Uh, the word probably means sheep land. Seer is Egyptian word for sheep. It could be. But you had to go abroad. Well, that's strange. And you had to go to this woman. And uh, she wasn't exclusive at all. Everybody went to her. She was the one. Well, she was the mother goddess. See? The rights of the mother goddess always which come at the particular times of year are the rights of the hero duels. That's the sacred prostitutes. And everybody in Babylon, for example, as Herodotus tells us, and, uh, had to go and have intercourse with the temple Herodules once a year. Every woman, before she could be married, had to serve as a Herodule. And the book of Abraham, of course, begins with that, the story. Remember the three virgins that were put to death because they wouldn't compromise their virtue. They were members of the royal family and so forth. Well, that was a very well-known story. That the, if you didn't, you were in trouble. They didn't do it, and of course Abraham was the, the abominations, the human sacrifice, and all the rest. It was pretty terrible, and Abraham became a victim and the like. So we have that type of civilization, and you'll find it's worldwide, it's ancient. It's, that's, our, that's our number two, our, our Babylonian, because she is the, the rich, remember what she's called? She's the scarlet woman, the, the woman of Babylon. She is, it is the, it's a matriarchy, it's the old matriarchy. It's agriculture, it's uh, very stable, it goes on. All these, these have weaknesses and so forth. So we, it's, it's a, a very, another of those marks of authenticity in the Book of Mormon emerges where we have the queens only among the Lamanites and they're something different because the, the, the model society of the Nephites is that of the brethren and that of the Lamanites is uh, number two. There's you notice Lamanites is mixed. They're, they're two and three, three members of the warlords and they're mixed here and well, they're always mixed around anyway. But uh, you know what the routine is with these? Well, any more about the queens. The, uh, the, uh, yes. What happens to the number one societies? Yeah, I mean, you have the pure brotherhoods and so forth. Zion. We talked about monastic life throughout the world and so forth. You find these everywhere, and they're very clearly marked. Of course, they always have the bowers of poverty, chastity, obedience. They share their property. They work on the land and so forth. And uh, they, uh, they are our brotherhoods, and you find them, as I say, at all times and places. They're very ancient. They go back 
Garden of Eden, as far as that goes. What happens to them? They're destroyed by vanity. Every time, every time, because they get the idea that they're too exalted and leaders uh, aspire see, to, uh, to mystical heights and to Godhead uh, prematurely. But vanity gets away with them every time. Intellectual, spiritual, and the right. The Pythagoreans, uh, it, it fools them. So you end up in the lodges, uh, the various brotherhoods, the lodges, the Illuminati. Uh, you read a, a work like uh, Zanoni by Bulwer Lytton, a very famous British writer, statesman, and so forth. Uh, that's the vanity of the Illuminati and, and the Masons and so forth. Well, they spoil themselves by getting too high and mighty, and uh, they get ahead. They don't. The revelation they don't have, but they're, uh, they dress themselves in fancy clothes and have their rights and so forth and become quite spooky after a while. They all go into occultism and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so, number one, what we call the Brotherhoods, uh, always end up that way. And what happens to number two? Well, they're always overrun by number three. We mentioned that. That's, that is basic to geopolitics. Yes, Rosie? I'm sorry, I can't hear about what you're saying. Oh, oh really? Uh, oh, this is supposed to be, pick it up, eh? Well, then let's use it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> As we were saying, yeah, that makes it louder, doesn't it? Uh, now you have number two, you see, and that is your, your Babylonian civilization, which is overripe to fall, the uh, book of Revelations and so forth. The Scarlet Moon Revelations, there you find the perfect description of that, of course. And, uh, and who overruns it? Well, of course, the warlords of the steppes, those in Central Asia. Now, the idea was, Haushofer's geopolitic was that who controls the heartland controls the world. Because that's the central basis from which you attack in all directions when they're driven. And every time what's happened to those civilizations, which are all peripheral, as you know, where it's Chinese or Babylonian or Hindu, Indian, you see Mohenjo-Daro, or it's Egyptian, or it's Hittite, they expand and overrun them and then become absorbed by them. They destroy them in the air. It's happened again and again in cycles, year 1200. The whole works was wiped out. There were all those civilizations that were great. Uh, 3,000, about 3,000, 3,100 before the same thing had happened earlier. Then in 1,700 it happens, then in 1,200 it's, it happens. Uh, and uh, what was his name? Not Charles uh, Schultz. I think of his name well, but anyway. Uh, well, lots of work has been done on that. They overrun them and mix with them. And, uh, but what happens to them? Well, they're like a bubble that explodes. They expand so far. Remember, they're a very unstable form of society. They depend on the grass and they depend on loot and so forth. They're the wandering tribes of the steppes. And it's the Russian model. And it happens too again, you see, the Asiatic model. They expand as far as they can go. See, here's the heartland. I say it's shaped like a shield. And uh, they go out and they invade China. The Mongol dynasties of China, and the Tartars and so forth invade China and set up the various dynasties. And the Mughals in India come in the 17th century and are there, and you find them everywhere in all directions, of course. And what caused the Crusades? It wasn't the, it wasn't the Muslims. They didn't uh, go to get the holy places back from the Muslims in, in 1095 when the first crusade began. They went because the Mongols had invaded, and in 1071, at a great battle, they had overcome Yarmouk, they had overcome the Muslims and had taken over and closed all the holy places. They'd taken everything over. They were the barbarians from the steppe. They were absorbed too, but they were, that was why the crusaders had to go and free the holy land and the holy sepulcher and that, because the Mongols had invaded. So always these people that come out from time to time, and it comes out regularly, and but then what happens? I say, then their bubble explodes, I see, because I say they're, they're an unstable form of existence, but they also are absorbed. Remember, the greatest who, who built the Taj Mahal? Well, it was a Mughal empire, one of the Mongolians. They'd only been there a couple of generations. They were new. You find in India, in the, uh, the languages of India are like the unpeeling of a, an onion. There are 11 different layers. They're all related languages. Each one comes in a different way, and they all come through the Khyber Pass, you see. So you have these walls. You have the Great Wall of China. You have the Wall of the Asiatics in, in Egypt. Uh, you have the Limes in Europe, built by the Romans more great walls great, to keep the barbarians out. None of them ever succeeded in keeping them out. But, uh, and you have, as I say, walls everywhere. Uh, but they come in and they get absorbed and uh, not all of them. But the ways of the steps go on, these ways go on, the ways of Babylon go on, the ways of the brotherhoods go on, diluted and so forth. And who's the winner in the end? It's number four. The poor old primitives are by the people living in the, in the brush and so forth, the digger Indians, people like that. Uh, 
They're exploited and exterminated like crazy, you see, because their helpers are being exterminated today. Very few are, dis are appearing again. But, you know, we know now very clearly that they always reemerge because when these others collapse, that's what you go back to. That's generally conceded today. It was always thought the, the archaeologists are looking for primitives, you see, like the Indians are primitive. They're not primitives. They're descendants of civilizations that have disappeared. Now, for example, some of you missionaries may know that the, the Mayans are still the Mayans. Archaeologists visited them as primitive people. There's nothing primitive about them. They still speak Mayan and so forth, but they don't have the civilization anymore. But everywhere you go, these people, in very small numbers, are hiding in the, in the outback, like the Australians. What we have, you see, is ruins, America, Central North America, impressive ruins, I mean, uh, Chaco Canyon, things like that, uh, and Mesa Verde in North America, uh, Altavi, and these magnificent ruins show that they had, their children are still there, but they're now called primitives. Of course, you can't find a real primitive. There's no such thing. They're just survivors from other times. So, so the cycle runs. One, two, three, four, you have them. Of course, there's others that are in between. There's various mixtures. This is very clearly brought out in the Book of Mormon, in, in, in chapter 4 here, uh, in chapter uh, 47. The, uh, a question might arise here. I've got something here. Uh, you read this chapter, and you say, now, wait a minute. And you say, this isn't a... This isn't a letdown, this isn't an anticlimax after that amazing chapter 46 with all that evidence in it and so forth. This has more evidence too, but you say, what have these sordid doings got to do with the plan of salvation, you see? What has religion got to do with this? What do we learn from Amalekiah's dirty tricks? And boy, did he have a string of them. He knew everyone in the book. Uh, what does this teach us? This is rather a depressing history of religion, isn't it? Well, just consider now. I've been frantically looking over all sorts of old traditions so from the life of Abraham. They've been collected, of course, he is the best documented of all ancient persons was Abraham. And they say he didn't live, don't fool yourself, he was a real person. But uh, what, a, what a sad story, it's one prolonged horror of great darkness, as Genesis 15 tells us. Was the horror. His life was a continued trial, the ten trials of Abraham. He lived in a world that was a hell, complete. Remember, this has been caught up with recently. In recent years, Abraham has caused great attention and so forth because of new documents and the like. But you notice the book of Abraham that catches it. It begins with Abraham in the soup. He's going to be sacrificed. It begins saying, I, Abraham, the land of my father, thought that it was, I would have to find a new place of residence. He couldn't hang on there any longer. He protested with his own family, and his father, own father wanted him put to death to the mother goddess and so forth. Uh, and uh, it was that bad, you see. They utterly refused to hearken to my voice, he says. He protested, he was thrown out, and from then on he was a wanderer in the earth. He was finally buried uh, in the cave of Machpelah, which he had to buy from the Hittites. And he wanted to rent it from the rented cave, didn't he? He never had anything, he never had a land of his own. He was the wanderer, he was the stranger everywhere. In a world that was absolutely wrecked by blight, it was a drought, terrible times. Remember, the famine waxed sore, and the famine still waxed sore, and they always had to move, in, to move into Egypt, got into that trouble, having bad times in Egypt, too, moved out to Gerar at bad times with Abimelech, then moved over to Sodom and Gomorrah, and then, uh, well, just before that, and all hell broke loose there. They had a real atomic blast there. That's a tremendous thing. Wiped everything out. The five cities of the plain, all gone. It was an awful time Abraham went through, and horrible people he was dealing with, his arch enemy, Nimrod, Amraphel, trying to put him to death all the time, and the five kings, and this, everybody betraying everybody else, his arguments with Lot, and... And uh, no, Abraham is not a happy history. It's a very sad one, the trials of Abraham. And he had to undergo those trials. I say, if he was going to have the supreme reward, he had to be given, willing to face everything and suffer everything. And he is the type. You must do the works of Abraham if you would have the rewards of Abraham. And so we're living in a world very much like Abraham's world, and we have this opportunity. When these dispensations come, these great turning points, like Abraham, remember, he was the founder of everything. Everything comes from Abraham, the father of many nations and so forth. See, he had three wives. One wife was Sarah, as you know, who was the mother of all your Semites and the like. Uh, but he also had Hagar. He married Hagar, who was usually called the daughter of Pharaoh. She was an Egyptian woman. And Ishmael was his son. And Ishmael got the very same promise 
that Isaac got. He would be the father of many nations, you see. Of course, this, this mixes in with our Book of Mormon, because Lehi was a Manasseh who, Ephraim and Manasseh, we are too, and he was the, the father, the son, Ether Manasseh were the, the sons of Asenath, who was the wife of the high priest of Heliopolis in Egypt. She was pure blood of Ham. She was a princess in Egypt, and we're descended from her. You see, it's all mixed up here. So Hagar was of Ham. Uh, Sarah was of Japheth, and what about uh, who was of Sem? What about Japheth, the three sons? Japhethic, those are the people of East. Uh, he, the Greeks knew that, of course, Noah's third son was Iapetus, they say, and they were descended from Iapetus, who was Javan. Well, he married a strange thing. After Sarah died, it, was all, it seemed to be all over, uh, he married Keturah. And Keturah was the descendant of Japheth. And she had six sons by Abraham. And he taught them all the advanced arts, sciences, sophistication, mathematics, and things that he had exchange with the Egyptians too, and they went and found where the great founders of Western civilization, wherever you go, the six sons of Keturah leave their mark uh, in southern Italy and Greece and so forth. This is the, these are the traditions and so forth. You see, all these three, and once you start mixing genes like that, it's amazing how far you can get around. As you know, if you worked with genealogy, you're related to everybody and his dog. It's just absolutely astounding how you can get related to people. When you start listing the what my kids have is just absolutely, see, I had a Jewish grandmother, and that mixes them with Judah, and then they're, uh, they're Scotch, Irish, English, Welsh, lots of, Scan lots of Scandinavian, of course, my wife's Scandinavian, but also lots of Slavic in it, too. They're from the Baltic states, and uh, you've got everything, absolutely everything, including Arabic, yes. Uh, and so, if you start looking around, you'll get these things, so it's not an exaggeration to say. The Book of Mormon is very interesting in this because we've used this simplistic idea. You read the Nephites and the Lamanites, don't kid yourself. Again, in this chapter, you'll read that they were not just Nephites and Lamanites. They divided up differently that way, their cultures and so forth. So anyway, uh, again, this, this sadness. But then after Genesis, after what do you have in the Book of Genesis? You have the fall, sad story. You have the flood, great tragedy. You have the terrible days of Enoch when he reached both his arms and wept and uh, said, I will refuse to be comforted. And then the Lord shows him the coming of the Lord later and so forth. But the Lord told Enoch, he said, Worlds without number have I created, and of all the workmanship of my hands, there is not so much wickedness as among thy brethren. This is some world we're on, see? So if you can pass this test, you're, you're ready for the long haul, but it's a real test. <laughs> but then what do you get in Exodus? The Exodus, nothing but suffering and sin and the folly of Israel in the desert. And, and then he gives the law, the five books of the law. He ends with Deuteronomy, in which he said, you never listened to the thing I said while I was with you. It'll be still worse when I leave you. And you've never kept the law, and you never will keep the law until the Messiah comes, and there's terrible pictures there. And then, in the Psalms, it's all mourning and sorrow and so forth. The, the first Psalm establishes the balance. There's the balance between the two. Asherah HaIshah Shehlo HaLakasah starts out, Happy is the man who does not sit in the councils of the wicked. Why always dwelling on the wickedness this way, the first Psalm? Uh, and does not go, I know it says, no go along with evil, but with the councils of evil. But he continues to contemplate the law, and the law is his joy day and night. And he shall be as a tree planted by a pool of water that bears its leaves in due time, and its fruit do not fail. But the evil, he says, he always brings them in. They are like <coughs> dried and withered trees, and fruits and withered leaves. Kamuts, like chaff that the wind blows. Kamuts, the of Penaruach. And four, then it says, God knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. There's the balance of ways that put above you, and you have your choice between them. It doesn't mention a thing throughout the Book of Mormon, never the promise of the land without the curse on the land. You're going to have to deal with both of them. And this is the bad time we're in now. Let that be a comfort to you. You're going through your bad time now. And then the historic books of the Bible, from then on, you see Samuel, jo Joshua, Judges, and the like, and Ruth, beginning with Ruth. Uh, what do you have there? Stories of blood and betrayal, the stories of David, stories of the patriarchs are bad enough, but when you get to the histories, that's why we know it's, it's uh, 
that it's sound, that it's good history. It doesn't idealize the kings. It doesn't make our people all heroes and the others all villains and so forth. Well, the Israelis is almost trying to do today. But not in, not in that time. It's frank. It shows David and Solomon and Rehoboam and all of them as the rascals they were. That, the bad side of their character. The great men all the same. And then we get to the wisdom of literature, which we read some of the other. Vanity of vanities. It's all nothing, you see. I've seen nothing there. It's nothing new under the sun. Uh, there's nothing but woe on uh, the man here who is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Nothing but trouble. <laughs> then we come to the New Testament and the Lord, the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehends it's not. It's all being built up to, to the crucifixion. And uh, they won't accept him, they won't hear him or anything like that. And this is very important. Uh, Jesus and the apostles were in the world but not of the world. So the world hated them with a relentless hatred. You see, and what, couldn't destroy them quickly enough. We say being in the world, but not of it. If you are of it, it will love you. If you're not of it, it will hate you. So if you're in the world and not of the world, don't expect to succeed in business. You are persona non grata. You will never succeed. The Lord says the world cannot hate you. Uh, the world will hate you because, well, Abraham was unwelcome everywhere he went, you see. Joseph Smith, from the moment he announced his mission, was in deep trouble all the time with, ev with everybody. And the Lord says, who convicts me of evil? If you have nothing against me, why are you mad at me? Well, it's that, uh, the, the resentment, the fear. What it is, a culture of shock and a fear. Whenever the angels appear, everybody's scared to death. But you know, John is the best example for that. John 14 through 17, it just keeps repeating that all the time. Whom the world cannot receive. The world seeth me no more. I'm leaving it. Uh, it is given to us, the Lord, the apostles say to him, why do you speak the, give these things to us and not to the world? Uh, he says, because to, them, to you it is given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not known. And so it was not known. And then he says, the prince of this world, all this is in the 14th chapter, the prince of this world cometh who hath nothing in me. Henceforth I will not walk any longer with you. I'm leaving because the prince of this world cometh. If you are of the world, you see, in the world, but not of the world. The world would hate you. Well, if you're not of the world, the world will hate you. He says, that's an absolute guarantee. He repeats it. Because it hated me. If it has hated me, it has hated you. And he says, the 19th verse, the 15th chapter. If you were of the world, the world would love you, and you'd be successful, and you'd be elected, and everything else. But you are not of the world. I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. They hated you. They persecuted me, they will also persecute you. They have both seen and hated both me. He says, if I had not done the miracles I'd done so they could see them, they would be without excuse. Why do I do this if the world is going to reject me? Because they must be given a chance, he says. They would be without, but now they're without excuse because they have both seen and hated both me and my father. And without cause, he says. So the prince of this world is judged. I leave the world and go to the father. In the world you shall have tribulation and so forth. The men, not, and then he's 17th chapter, the last, and this is very much like 3rd Nephi, of course, he goes through this the same way when he prays. The men whom thou gavest me out of the world, I pray not for the world, but for them. Now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. So they're in the world, all right. Of course, they're not of the world, that's, therefore, they are hated. And they're in trouble all the time. You see. With them in the world, I have kept them in my name. The world hath, here at 14th verse, the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I don't take them out of the world. They have to suffer for a while, he says. Then. But they and I are not of the world. So it keeps harping on that. The only, say, the first person that said we can be in the world and not of the world and succeed was a Christian of the third century by the name of Diognetus who wrote on that. People were worried because the fact the church was getting too popular, as Brigham Young says, nothing could be worse than to be a fine, popular church and have the world approve of us. Then we'd know we were of the world, and that'd be a very bad sign. So here we are. Uh, and so he says, the 21st, 22nd verse, be one that the world may know that you have sent us. And 25, the world rejects them. He said he came to give the world a chance, but now they're without excuse and so forth. So, uh, but we give success our reason for being in the world. We say we're in the world so that we can succeed. But if you're out of the world, you won't succeed, believe me. They, they won't accept you, and so it goes. But, but now this chapter, this very interesting 47th chapter, is chapter, I say, of sordid crimes, misdemeanors, such a contrast with the 46th, but it's just as loaded with evidence material as the other. Of course, it's not the evidence primarily, but what we learn from it, we say, why did they tell us this sordid story? Well, back to the scriptures, and they tell us almost nothing else. 
And so we have this man, Malachi, who knows every dirty trick in the book. Now, anyone who wrote this book must have known a great deal about human nature. Of course, this reminds us so much of Shakespeare because of his tragedies and his king plays, which are plays of betrayal, <coughs> that sort of thing. Well, here we have a real Shakespeare villain, Iago, to begin with. Now, an ambitious person. Now we return to our record of the Malachias, 47, and those who had fled with him to the land of Nephi among the Nabonites, and they stirred up trouble. Uh, remember that wonderful talk that Brother Maxwell just gave about murmuring? He was a good murmur, and it could spread. People want to listen to that, and he, was, he didn't have much trouble doing that. Remember, Malachi was not able to pull it off with, because it tells us his own people, it tells him... 29th verse there, his own people were doubtful concerning the justice of his cause. Well, he hadn't convinced, he was a very, very smooth man, a great, a skillful talker, it says. But uh, still, they knew he wasn't honest. And boy, are going to see some, some tricks now. And uh, some fled with him to the land of Nephi among the Lamanites, and they started stirring up the Lamanites to anger by spreading dirty stories and rumors about... Uh, it's a very interesting, it said that uh, one of the great trials Abraham had to suffer I think, was the dirty stories they spread about Lot because of Lot and his daughters, the story of Lot and his daughters. And of course they were immoral enough, the cities of the plain would have been destroyed. But he said gossip pursued him all his days, even the righteous Abraham. So this is the sort of thing you had. Had no trouble stirring them up to anger against the Levi. So now... Uh, he fed the king with lies, and the king sent a proclamation throughout all the land that his people should gather themselves together again. See, they had just finished a war, uh, and uh, in which nobody won. It tells us the Nephites were just as sorry as all. There was stuff mourning in all the land. Everything was ruined, and they gained the victory and so forth. We, we knew why we had to suffer this was because of our own sins. It wasn't because of the guilt of the Lamanites at all. The usual story. And that was just after, see, Nephi has a hand-to-hand -hand duel with Amalekai. Uh, with, with Amalekai, that's another person. Notice they have all the same names, Amalekai. Notice these people are Mulekites. Uh, we see Amalekai as a Mulekai. They're not Nephites. See, this the cultural picture is more complex than you think. Well, anyway, this probably, uh, again, well, he must have been very persuasive, but the people were fed up. And that, they got a reaction. Believe me, was it negative? Came in. The people now know there's a, now we're on a dilemma, he says. Here's the way it was. The people feared to displease the king, and yet they also feared to go to battle against the Nephites. They'd had enough. They were fed up. Uh, incidentally, their terror of going to battle again is a great tribute to Nephi, uh, to, to uh, Moroni's great tactical skill, how he, with very limited resources, was able to, to push them around until they surrendered, and immediately he would grant them to go home. No reprisals, nothing like that. All right, you take an oath and you go home. And, and uh, there was no total victory or anything like that. Uh, Moroni was always a minute. You see, the minute you saw the tide, he very sensitive, saw the tide turning, he immediately offered terms to the other side. Said, How about when you surrender? And often they took him up. Uh, he was more respected by the, by the Lamanites than he was by anybody else, I think, because they had to deal with him. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. Uh, it was the historian, this recent historian just pointed out that uh, in all the writings, he's the uh, Civil War historian, um, in all the writings of Lee and Lincoln, neither ever refers to the other side as the enemy. They never refer to them as the enemy. It's the Confederacy, it's the Union, but never refer to each other as the enemy. That's an interesting thing, because everybody else, boy, were they full of it. Uh, the, uh, they feared to displease their king and they feared to go ba to battle against the Nephites. And it came to pass they actually went on a strike. They refused to do it. They flatly, it was flat uh, disobedience here, the uh, refusal to take orders. They would not, or the more part of them would not, obey the commandments of the king. It was a real strike, just like the Aussies in 1917. <laughs> The Australians bore the brunt of the World War II right beginning with uh, Gallipoli. And they took a terrible beating and then time after time, all for three years they held out, were held out on the British front with a terrible general just sent wave after wave to slaughter. It was the silliest thing in the world. And finally in 1917 the Aussies finally struck. They were the best soldiers in, in the war. But they wouldn't fight anymore. They refused to go back to the front. They, they were promised, you see, they were promised a furlough of just a couple of days. And, and that was taken back because the British crowd said, no, men should be able to take more than that. 
and so they went on a strike. We're all put in jail, and if it had been for a pardon for the king, they would have been jailed to this day, you see, as far as I know. But there comes a time when you can take so much, you see. These people were fed up. So they absolutely refused to go against their enemies. Well, remember what, well, later on, we're going to find out. The Mormon says, I did utterly refuse to, I became an idle onlooker. I did utterly refuse to go against my enemies. He wouldn't do it anymore. Uh, well, now that the king was fit to be tied, of course, they had directly defied his command. That was in subordination of the grossest type. The king was wroth because of their disobedience, and he gave Amal Malachi a command of the whole thing. Now, Malachi, he was a very impressive person. Uh, the, uh, and the loyal, there were some loyalist troops that would follow Amalekai. This is the usual mix-up. This is a very old story, everywhere you find it. But the person who wrote this knew a great deal. He was telling a real story. He commanded him that he should go forth and compel them to arms. A police action, like an archangel when the white army tried to force the red army to, uh, to oppose the Germans and so forth. It didn't work, you see. Uh, he's trying to do the same thing. Uh, well, that's up, up an archangel, that's later. But, uh, the loyalists weren't strong enough to do it. They were the larger army. And with Amalekai was a very subtle man, it says, that's to say the least. Uh, and he laid a plan in his heart to dethrone the king of the Lamanites. This is a long-range plan, and it worked. He worked it out beautifully. Now, this is a routine among the Romans, of course. Philip the Arab wanted to become emperor, and he did become emperor by a long plot. And you know the stories of Livia uh, plotting to get her son Tiberius on the throne after Augustus was in there, poisoning this person, that person, the other person, getting all the others out of the way. This is a common procedure, the, the poisoning of the, of the line to the throne. It's very dangerous to be in the line to the throne. <laughs> because uh, you're in line for poisoning. Uh, and so he took the parts of the Lamanites who were in favor of the king. So he took the loyalist troops with him. And he went to Oneida where the others had encamped themselves. The, uh, where, where all the Lamanites had fled. It tells us Oneida was the place of arms. Now the place of arms is interesting because there's always a place of arms where you go to rally in Nottingham in England usually. Uh, but like the field of Mars in Rome, the, 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 it was called the field of arms, the field of Mars. The Mars fields you find all over Europe in, in ancient times. It's the Maidan in the east. The Maidan was the field of arms. But in England they had it, you know. Uh, the field of Mars uh, is still hung on in the villages into the 19th century where you had the uh, the Morris dance, the Morris dance in the mazes, where they went through, and uh, it was a, uh, it was a drill, a sham battle, and so forth. They used to have the, but so this was the, the place of arms, the field of Mars and the Maidan, and they'd appointed their own leader. They'd set him up, and. Uh, and knew they, they knew they were being used. Uh, they were being used here being fixed in their minds with a determination resolute that they would not be subject to go against the Nephites. They weren't going to do that at all. Uh, this, as I say, is a tribute to Moroni. They were scared to death of the Nephites who were smaller uh, and uh, not nearly as warlike. And so they gathered themselves on, on the top of a mountain called Antipas. Now, of course, this is a tradition too, after all. Why do the Hopis live in the high mesas? Because they don't want to go to war. At one time, they were the most terrible of all fighters in the Southwest. Uh, but they didn't like it, and it was very interesting legends about this. And they took to the they took to the mesas, and where their enemies couldn't get at them, that's the safe place. Uh, the hill Antipas, there they were, and uh, you would run a risk to try to take over there. And they had appointed their leaders, as the tribes always do. You appoint your leader, and you know your Caesar. Uh, Gallic Wars, when the tribes start marching, they immediately the first thing they do is appoint a leader who's called a king, and he's to lead them. He's the king, and of course in old in, in English chronicles that's met with more than anywhere else. The king is the king or the one who knows. He's the, the one who leads you out. And he's chosen. The kings of England are always, are always elected, you see, there, by somebody or other. Uh, in the bloodline, of course, this leads to a lot of trouble. Uh, against the Edward and Henry III and so forth, when things get pretty bad, the king is incompetent. Then Parliament, the, the, the Lords puts on the heat, the barons puts on the heat. Uh, um, Simon de Montfort, I see 1065, uh, 1265 and so forth. And they take over. There was never a time when the king, if he was a bad one, couldn't be deposed. And so down they come like this. That's the story of Richard II, uh, rolling broke and so forth. The same thing here. You put your king in, they come and go, and they do the same thing in the Book of Mormon. The kings come in, kings go out, and uh, they're under popular pressure, and lots of plotting going on and intrigue. And this is a, this is a number one intriguer that we have here. This, this Amalekai really knew his way around. Uh, 
And it came to pass to gather on the Mount Antipas. And Malachi's intention was to gain favor with the Lamanites because they were the biggest number. He, that's the army he wanted. He wanted their army to take them and get rid of the king. So, and to place himself at their disposal at their head and take possession of the throne of the kingdom after all. Now some people just love plotting and planning. That's what makes so many of Shakespeare's plays so interesting. The king plays are all plots and plans, are all sorts of schemes. Um, we have, that's why we love spy dramas more than anything else. That's, I mean almost any drama, anything you'll turn on tonight on TV will be an intrigue and a plot in it, dirty work going on, along with the violence and the sex and the things we, that are absolutely mandatory to our lives now. And, uh, and the question arises, is peace possible in such a world? <laughs> and so we have this very interesting thing here, and this is the way they're going to do it. Uh, and it came to pass, he sent a secret embassy to the people on the Antipas, he wants to make a deal, see. And, uh, is come down and, and speak with me and we'll make a deal here. The eleventh verse here, uh, the man they had elected to be leader was Lehontai, but Lehontai, everybody was on to Malachi. He says, ah, I'm not coming down for you, Buster. And uh, so he invited him again, come down. No, I'm not coming down. Well, the third time, all right, I'll come and meet you. And don't be afraid, you can bring your bodyguard with you. You see, and you know he's going to get rid of him anyway. But uh, then he durst not come down. And the third time of Malachi, he says, uh, you know, he knew Malachi, as we said. Malachi's own people were doubtful of the justice of his cause. They didn't trust him all the way. Nobody trusted him. But was he clever? The third time, he went up to the mountain to bring down his guards with him. And he came down with his guards. And uh, then, what did Malachi do? He betrayed his own men. The lame light guards surrounded the people he was heading. The loyalists, he had his old loyalist people surrounded by the, guard, by the guards of Lehontai. Don't they come down? And Malachi desired him to come down with his army in the night time and surround the men in the camp. See, this is our deal. You bring your army down and surround my little army at the bottom there, and uh, the king's army. And uh, then he says, they would, I would deliver them into your hands. Then you wouldn't have to go to war and you wouldn't have to bother about the king or anything like that. They deliver up into Lehontai's hands if we would make him, Malachi, second leader over him. They always had not only a king, but they always had a second leader. So the first leader always remember the Romans. They had a Caesar. You had a, uh, you had a Caesar, you had an Augustus. Augustus was second class Caesar. And uh, Caesars were always being bumped off by the Augustuses so they could succeed them. You see, uh, in the 60 odd emperors of Rome, uh, by far the great majority were, were assassinated. Almost all of them were succeeded, usually by the head of the military. He would, well, a good example, I mentioned Philip the Arab, for example. He was the head of the Praetorian Guard, the emperor's personal bodyguard. Well, what did he do? Uh, in a cute trick, he, he stabbed the emperor and became emperor himself. And so, Decius, who was with some soldiers up in Germany, came down and got rid of him. And he became emperor. Uh, a great persecutor of the Christians. So this is the, the story, this is the world we live in, you see. We we're not going to leave this part out of the story. And uh, you, we're all going to see a lot of dirty work. We see it going on around us all the time today. And it gets worse. Uh, surrounded him. And it came to pass, Leontai came down and surrounded the men of Amalekiah. So Amalekiah betrayed his own army. He betrays everyone. Uh, the king is betrayed his own people to Amalekiah, and then Amalekiah betrayed his own army to Lehontai, and then the king's army becomes his while he betrays Lehontai with poison. Now he's going to get rid of Lehontai, the next you see, the next step in his uh, gratis ad parnasum, you'd say, or rather his gratis honorum, as the Romans call it, the steps of honor, the steps of, uh, of authority that you, you have to go through a gratis honorum. There are various steps that everyone aspired to. Everybody wanted a career. Everybody wanted to get to the top. They were very competitive. So you're going to get this sort of thing. He surrounded the men, and they did plead with Amalekiah, and uh, that he would suffer them to fall in with their brethren. So instead of destroying them when he surrounded, they joined them, and so he had a super army now. He had the loyalists he led, and they were also joined by Lehontai's people, in which he was second in command. But he's not going to remain second for very long. Not if you know our, our dear Malachi. And it came to pass that he delivered his men contrary to the commandments of the king. That's an understatement. So now he's second leader in the 17th verse. He's second leader. Uh, that's the meaning of lieutenant. The lieutenant is the one who takes the place of the other. Capitan means head man, top man, captain, caput, you see. And the other one is uh, locus tenor, the one who locus tenor, the one who holds the place, the second place of the, 
the ship never means holds the second place of the captain who is the first place. So we have the captain the whole tie with Amalekiah as lieutenant. But again, he's not going to remain that very long. Uh, Amalekiah caused that one of his servants should administer poison by degrees to Lahontai. Alexander the Sixth, Caesar Borgia. Uh, how, how Alexander the Sixth became Pope, he was Caesar Borgia and he, he poisoned a line of people and he had finally one, one cardinal stood in his place, that was Cardinal McKelly, and he poisoned him and then he became that was Caesar Borgia, and then he became the great Pope Alexander the Sixth. That's the way you do. You poison a line of people, as I say, and you come in there. The Borgia, we always think of Borgias when we think of of uh, poisoning Lucretia and Caesar. They they work their way to the top by poisoning. Uh, and so the Lamanites appointed Amalekiah to be their leader and chief commander. Notice it says here in the 18th. Verse here, it came to pass the Huntai, caused one of his servants to administer poison by degrees to the And uh, then the Lamanites appointed Amalekai to be their leader and chief commander. And Amalekai is now the leader of the whole thing. So what does he do? He marched to the city of Nephi to throw, overthrow his lord, the king, for whom he was working. He was the king, and now he's going to overthrow the king. So he marches to the city of Nephi, the chief city, to overthrow the king. Well, but how does he do it? Well, the king came out to meet him to hail the conquering hero. <coughs> this happens again, you see. You hail someone coming back. The king came out to meet Amalekiah. He put forth his hand to give him the sign of peace and lift him up. And uh, the custom they had taken from the Nephites, notice these cultural exchanges that go on, and uh, like Elagabalus, he got stabbed being greeted as he came home and so forth. And this is the direct method that Sir Richard III uses, same way. And of course he raised a hue and cry and uh, roused up the usual suspects and so forth. And of course this is what they do in, Ma in Macbeth, you all know from Macbeth. They say well, when, they, when, they plot the, when they, they plot the murder of Duncan, he's the king, you see, and, he, and he, uh, Macbeth has has risen by degrees this way. First he's the king of uh, Glamis, uh, the king of Glamis, then he's the of God, now he wants to be king. And uh, Duncan comes here tonight, she says, and uh, yes. When in drunk, he's talking about the two guards. They're, now the, sleep, the king is sleeping in his bedroom with the two, with two uh, chamberlains to guard him. And he says, uh, uh, and they get them drunk at the feast. And he says, uh, when in drowsy sleep their drunken natures lie, what cannot you and I put upon his chamberlains? Uh, especially, she says, as we shall raise human crimes as they get, uh, and make them guilty. He says, I'll gild the faces of the grooms with all. She's going to smear them with blood so it looks as if they committed the murder. For it must seem their guilt. Play on words, you see. I'll gild them so they see their guilt. And when we've done this, what might not you and I put upon his spongy offers as who shall bear the gills of our great quill? These officers will be guilty for the crime we committed because we'll yell, look, the people, his servants have killed him, his own servants. And that's exactly what happened here. It's a, it's a well-known trick as far as that goes. And, uh, and then she says, well, and then when we get who, who dare challenge our authority when we're king and queen, you see. Uh, none dare something, our, our high officer, I think even a minute. Always have to wait a minute. Slowing down terribly these days. Well, that happens. Old age and that sort of thing. Uh, so he raised a cry and saying, Behold, the servants have done this thing. And Malachi pretended, pretended to be wroth. He gets angry about it. The usual, see, round up the usual prospects is a terrible crime that's been committed. Whoever loves their king, let him go forth and pursue the servant. That's exactly what you'd say. What a loyalty it is. Uh, and Macbeth, he has to announce that, he, that he'd killed them because they know he says, and yet I regret that I did it. And Macbeth, Macbeth, Macduff whirls them and says, why did you do that? He immediately becomes suspicious. He says, why did you do that? Well, he says, who can be calm and temperate in a moment? There lie Duncan, his golden skin, laced, his silver skin laced with his golden blood. What man can be temperate, control himself under those I had to, had to bump him off? Macbeth doesn't buy that too well. So later on he says, King Cotter Glamis, thou hast it all, and I fear thou hast paid, played most foully for it. So I guess a typical Amalekiah. And of course you would say here that Joseph got it from Macbeth being quite a student of Shakespeare, Joseph Smith, uh, especially when he was 20 years old working his head off in the farm. Uh, but 
if it weren't a, a common pattern. I mean, it happens all the place. I mean, Livia was a very skillful poisoner, as you know. She poisoned everybody that got in Tiberius' way, as you find out in, in Livy. Livy writes about Livia. Uh, so he pretended this wrath. Now the servants of the king saw what he was doing and they got out of there. They hightailed out of there. And that makes it look more good. See, they fled. They show they're guilty because they ran away. His plot's working out, you see. They fled over and joined the people of Ammon. That's the simple, uh, sensible thing to do. Join these good, uh, peaceable people of Ammon. And uh, what a relief to get away from all that sort of thing. And thus Amalekiah did by his fraud gain the hearts of the people the fraud will do it, you see. His public relations savvy was what, uh, very skillful. You can win the hearts of the people by fraud. Look at Adolf Hitler. Uh, look at Claudius. Shakespeare in Hamlet. Shakespeare's Claudius does the very same thing, very smooth. You can smile and smile and be a villain, uh, as, as Hamlet says. And everybody goes for him. Or Noriega. You can do this, you see. You can, you can gain the hearts of the people. Uh, and the city of Nephi with his army, and he took possession of the city. Now he's everything, but he's got to marry the queen. Ah, the queen smells a rat too. Now we're going to have trouble here, you see. Notice quite a career this man has. I think it's very interesting. Quite a novel you could write. With an imagination like that, Joseph Smith could really have been quite a novel. Therefore, when the queen received the message, she sent to Amalekiah, come in and tell me, oh dear Amalekiah, what's been going on? Isn't it terrible, he says to her. Uh, and she also asked to bring witnesses of what had happened. She's not going to take his word alone. See, nobody trusts Amalekiah all the way. He says, bring witnesses, so tell me how it really happened. So Amalekiah did. He went to the queen, and he had his witnesses, he had his stooges, and they all testified unto her that the king was slain by his own servants, and that also. They have fled, and doesn't this show that they're guilty? They say they have fled. Does this does not this testify against them? The fact that they have fled, of course, flight always assumes guilt. And so it came to pass that Amalekiah sought the favor of the queen, and he took her unto himself. Like the opening scene of Richard III, remember? Richard III has just murdered a man. Here's, here is his wife at the funeral, and he comes in, and on the scene, he proposes marriage to her. And she knows that he's murdered him, too. And he's such a smooth talker, he actually wins her over. Now imagine that, if you can do things like that. The world is full of rascals, and how loyal was the queen anyway, we begin to wonder, her husband being something of a bore. But, uh, and she at least found Richard interesting, went into the queen and to the place where they sat, and they all testified, uh, it doesn't just sit well there, Malachi sought favor of the queen. And thus by his fraud, and by his assistance, he obtained the kingdom. And throughout all the land, among all the people, now notice the people he ruled over, it was a complex. It wasn't just Lamanites and Nephites, but he was a Mulekite himself. But Lamanites were composed of Lamanites and Lemuelites and Israel. They'd kept their identity, their tribal identity they'd kept as Lamanites and Lemuelites and Ishmaelites. And probably had different dialects, just as the different villages of the Hopis had different dialects close together as they are. All dissenters of the Nephites, from the reign of Nephi down to the present time, we have this complex picture. It names four different different groups here. Now, uh, these, well, just, just about on the button here, this chapter, and it tells us that it was the way of the dissenters in this mingling around, they became the hardest boy of all. They became more hardened and impenitent and more wild and wicked and ferocious than Lamanites. See, the Lamanites absorbed them, and this is what happens, just as the, the civilizations absorb the warlord people, so the other way happens too. The warlord people can absorb them. They, they make their ways more savvy. Drinking in with the traditions of the Lamanites, we just read here on verse 23 that, just quite mentioned quite casually, that the custom of the king raising the victor to his feet uh, by reaching him his hand was a custom which they had taken from the Nephites. Now, here there, Nephites are taking customs from them as they take customs from the Nephites. And they, Drinking in with the traditions of the Lamanites, giving way to indolence and all manner of lasciviousness. See, they're, they become the they're more relaxed warlords now, but they're a mixture, see. Entirely forgetting the Lord their God. Well, they're not the brotherhood anymore, at least. The apostles, the, uh, the, the apostles, the, the apostates are the worst here. So, and then we get a cult, cult, cultural picture again. You see what you'd call the primitives. They almost went down to that level, living, giving way to indolence and all manner of lascivious, you know, self-control, continually, particularly, and so forth, a mixture of... But they're no longer warlords here, you see, they aren't. But they are, see, they're on their way, they're degrading, they're on their way down to what we're, we're called primitives. They'll become innocent later on, you see, as far as that goes, when they, uh, when they lose their resources and go back to nature again. 
Well, now let's see. I wonder if chapter 48 will be an anticlimax after this. This was an unpleasant chapter, but this children is the world we live in, isn't it? We have to face these things. Or do we have to face it? We have to know where we are. But what do you do in a case like this? How do, how do you hold your own in this kind of a world? Well, that's the beauty of it. We heard that at conference. What you do, you have prayer, of course. You have direct access to the top man. You don't have to go through channels or anything else. A lot was said about that. A lot about gossip, a lot about the, the authorities and how we're to respect them, how we're to go through them, what their office is, what our obligations are, and so forth. We know what we have to do. But always the way is wide open to the top man. You can go right through for satisfaction. That's what we're commanded to do. So let not your hearts be troubled by this sort of stuff.